Madam President, uh, this is the sixth in my series of speeches on the line item veto. Last week we followed Hannibal during his terrible journey over the Alps and his invasion of Italy in 218 BC with a force of 26,000 men having lost almost half of his army during the awful passage through the Alps. We then uh, followed him to the battle at the Ticinus River in November of 218 BC, where in a battle with the Romans, he wounded the Roman consul, Publius Cornelius Scipio. Then we went with him to the Battle of the Trebia in December of that year, where he, through superior generalship, destroyed the consular armies of Scipio and uh, Tiberius Sempronius Longus, in which battle the Romans lost 25,000 men killed and captured. He then went into the rich plain of Tuscany, where at the Battle of Lake Trasimene, he created a, a trap in which 15,000 Romans were killed, including uh, the consul Flaminius uh, himself. This was in 217 uh, BC. Subsequent to the catastrophe at Lake Trasimene, the Roman Senate recognized the gravity of the situation and also recognized that it called for a drastic change. The Senate, therefore, arranged for the appointment of a dictator whose office, as we have noted in an earlier speech, lasted uh, only six months at the longest. The choice for dictator fell upon uh, Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus. He was a Roman of the old type. And uh, he was the first to recognize that the religious ceremonies of the Roman people had been neglected. He therefore uh, took steps to see that in every respect the divine element was not neglected and that the religious ceremonies would be uh, kept, that the rites and sacrifices would be observed. And in this way, the morale of the people, to a great extent, was reestablished. He also determined that there should be a new policy concerning Hannibal. And it would be the, what would later become the Fabian policy. A policy of harassment of Hannibal's army while avoiding an all-out battle.
And so when Hannibal moved his army, Fabius would follow along with his forces in the foothills of the Apennines, from whence he could send out raiding parties to harass Hannibal and uh, attack his flanks, but never engaging Hannibal in an all-out battle. Now this policy caused, caused some consternation in Rome and in the Roman camp. In all previous campaigns, the Romans would seek out the enemy, march out, and fight him. And with a combination of their skills and discipline, bring him to his knees. So we can understand the resentment in Rome and in the Roman camp as they saw district after district in Italy go up in flames while the Roman legions were compelled by the policy of Fabius to uh, follow along slowly behind the Punic invader. Therefore, their was given to Fabius an agnomen, cunctator, the delayer. So that his name then was Quintus Fabius Maximus Furiacosus Cunctator. The delayer. Romans didn't like this idea. Not giving battle to the invader. But Fabius knew what he was doing. And Hannibal knew what he was doing. And Hannibal was concerned. Hannibal needed to fight great battle. And he needed to win spectacular victories in order to entice the allies away from Rome and to encourage them to join Hannibal's ranks. But the policy of Fabius would gradually wear Hannibal down. Hannibal knew this. Because it would never cost the Romans in manpower. While Hannibal's forces would over time be whittled away through attrition. Then there came news that must have been encouraging to Hannibal news that the Roman Senate did not intend to reappoint a dictator and that Rome would revert to the consular system of having two consuls, each consul with an army made up of two legions and each consul to exchange with the other constable, consul on every other day, the command of the army uh, in the field. One of the Roman consuls that was chosen in uh, 216 BC was Lucius Emilius Paulus. He was a partisan of the aristocracy. He had been a consul before and he had a good military record. The other consul, Gaius Terentius Varro, was a known demagogue. He had managed to 
get into office by his defamatory attacks on Fabius, the dictator, and his policy of avoidance of battle uh, with Hannibal. Hannibal was compelled to capture Roman supply depots in order, or, or to live off the countryside in order to feed his army. And so in the spring of 216 BC, Hannibal's army began to move. He moved uh, southward and crossing the Aphidus River descended upon the town of Cannae. Cannae was uh, one of the original Roman grain depots and one from which the Romans had been supplying their armies. By seizing Cannae, Hannibal therefore deprived the Romans of a main source of supply while at the same time providing a more than adequate supply of food for his own armies his own army. The Roman Senate then ordered Paulus and Varro, together with the proconsuls, the consuls of the previous year, Attilius and Servilius, to engage the Punic invader in battle and to retake the town of Cannae. Toward the end of uh, July of that year, 216 BC, therefore, these several Roman armies converged on the town of Cannae. Hannibal, having been the first to arrive, had had an opportunity to carefully examine the area all around Cannae and the Alphidus River. He therefore selected a level plain to do battle on which to do battle. As this would give his uh, cavalry, his Numidian horsemen, an opportunity to demonstrate their superiority over the Roman allied cavalry. Paulus and Varro and Servilius and Attilius were late in arriving. They were unfamiliar with the ground and they arrived after a long march. But Paulus, having a good military record and having some considerable experience in military matters, saw clearly that the level plain was advantageous to a cavalry action. He therefore cautioned Varro that it would be more advantageous to the Roman legions and their allies to move to hillier ground. This was on the first day in which the armies, the opposing armies, had had an opportunity to 
kind of view one another from a distance. Well, on the next day, on the second day after the armies had come within sight of one another, Varro was in command. He, would not, he did not agree with Paulus that the armies should be moved to higher and more hilly, more hilly ground. He would have nothing to do with anything that savored of Fabius the delayer. And any talk of hillier ground made him all the more determined to move down on the plain. So he decided to move the armies down on the plain behind uh, the hill of Canny. On the third day, Paulus was again in command. And the two camps, which had been set up opposing one another, perhaps about two miles apart, being on the east side of the river, Hannibal moved over on the west side. And so did Paulus. But Paulus did not accept Hannibal's ch challenge to do battle. On the fourth day, when it was Varro's turn again to take the command, shortly after sunrise, on August 2, 216 BC, he began to move his forces out of the camp and on to the field. And as the Romans were drawing up their battle formation, Hannibal placed his forces into the pattern that he had designed uh, for them. The Numidian cavalry was stationed on the far right. of center. The heavy ca cavalry made up of Carthaginians was stationed on the far left near the Alphidus River. It was noticeable that the Carthaginian center was drawn forward in a curious crescent-shaped formation with the cusp or convex of the crescent projecting toward the enemy. Varro, in uh, drawing up his forces, he being in command of all the armies on this occasion, the Roman army, placed his allied ca cavalry on the Roman left. And the Roman cavalry on the Roman right. Varro did not establish any wings on this occasion. 
He packed all of the Roman legions and the allied infantry into one dense formation, intending that the weight of the armored legions would punch a hole a thousand yards wide right through Hannibal's center. Hannibal stationed his um, Carthaginian and Libyan heavy infantry as wings to the left and to the right of the center. These Carthaginians and Libyans were his more experienced veterans. And they were equipped with swords and shields that had been taken from the Romans at Lake Tra Trasimene. Hannibal opened the battle proper with his Gauls and Spaniards in the crescent center. They were his swordsmen. Leaving the Carthaginian and Libyan heavy infantry as reserves on both wings where they formed uh, rectangles flanking the, the projecting crescent. Livia says that both armies pushed straight ahead. The Roman cavalry was promptly overwhelmed and defeated, and it turned and fled. The Numidian cavalry engaged the Allied cavalry. Slowly but surely, the cusp of the crescent-shaped center yielded and fell back a little more, then a little more, till it became a straightened line. And then an indentation. And then a concave crescent. while the densely packed legions and their allies having been deprived of the mobility which the open formation normally gave to them began to pour in one behind another. Like a stream of armor bursting through a collapsing 
dyke. And yet on either side of the yielding center, the Carthaginian and Libyan heavy infantry stood firm. So far, the Carthaginian wings had taken no part in the battle. The Numidian cavalry had triumphed over the Allied cavalry and was pursuing the enemy wherever it uh, scattered. All the while, the Roman and Allied legions were continuing to drive in Hannibal's center. Then a trumpet sounded. And the moment had arrived. Hannibal's uh, tactic of double envelopment of the Roman legions was complete. The two, Carthage the two Carthaginian sides moved in. The convex center had now become a U-shaped Crescent. The rectangles of uh, heavy infantry projected beyond the U shaped center, like the banks of a river of. the banks enclosing a river of moving armor. The Carthaginian heavy cavalry, which by now had completed, completely routed the Roman cavalry and was returning, moved to the center and attacked the Roman legions from the rear. The Numidian cavalry did the, the same. So to complete the terrible trap. The Roman legions, this great mass of men, closely packed, so close that they could no longer use their weapons, were in this trap. And they found that their rear lines were being assailed. Completely encircled now. Since the Gauls and the Spaniards continued to fight on. Ferociously contesting every foot of ground. The Romans and their allies, therefore, were completely stricken as the two Carthaginian sides moved in like the sides of an enfolding vice. On that uh, hot August afternoon, on the plain of Cannae, the greatest defeat 
ever delivered to the Roman legions occurred. Plutarch and Appian tell us that 50,000 Romans were killed. Quintilian says 60,000. Polybius says 70,000. The consul Lucius Emilius Paulus was killed. Varro, the man who was responsible for the disaster, had fled. In addition to Paulus, the two proconsuls, Servilius and Attilius, died. Eighty senators, two questors, state treasurers, twenty-nine military tribunes. Over half of those scions of noble Roman blood died on the field of Cannae that afternoon. The volume of loot was colossal. The loot that the Carthaginians gathered at the Roman camp and on the, on the field of battle. Arms and armor, silver and gold, horse trappings, horses and baggage. And it was said that the gold signet rings that were taken from the fingers of the fallen Roman knights amounted to three bushels. In weight. Hannibal sent ten of the Roman captives who had been taken prisoner at the battle, together with a Carthaginian noble, Carthalo, to Rome. Cothelo was to offer to ransom the, soldier, the prisoners taken at the Battle of Cannae. If Hannibal had any high expectations, he was bound to be disappointed. Cothelo was not allowed to enter Rome and was told to be clear of all the city, city's territory before nightfall. So if Hannibal had hoped by his magnanimity to determine the state of Roman morale, the, the, the Roman Senate was equally determined that Hannibal learned that there had been no weakening of morale. Rome then displayed its iron mood. The Roman Senate doubled the war tax. And uh, provided that Slaves should be bought from their owners on condition of their enlistment into the Roman legions. Prisoners were to be removed from the jails, from the jails on condition that they join the Roman legions. And the Senate provided that all of the artisans and craftsmen be utilized in the manufacture of armaments. The Rome 
Roman Senate showed its teeth. Fabius was reinstituted as dictator. And once more he inaugurated the old Roman code. And he became again the rock upon which Roman morale was strengthened and placed in charge again of the defense of the country. And through his policy, the Fabian policy, Hannibal would never again be given the opportunity to deal a catastrophic blow to the Roman armies. such as they suffered on the field of Cannae that afternoon in 216 B.C. If the Romans were rash enough to engage Hannibal in battle, or to accept an engagement in battle through a challenge by Hannibal, they would learn the usual bloody lesson. Such a lesson was taught in the year 209 BC at Herdonia. Fulvius Contumulus, a proconsul, was encamped against the town of Herdonia, which was controlled by pro Carthaginian Italians. Hannibal heard of this threat, and by force marches he came up out of Bretium and engaged the Roman legions that were besieging the town of Herdonia. While his cavalry attacked the legion from the rear, Hannibal's infantry struck from the front and the flanks. And uh, the outcome was another one of those humiliating defeats which until the end of the war made every Roman general tremble. Meanwhile in 207 uh, BC Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal was victorious over two Roman legions, two, Ro two consular armies, as a matter of fact, in Spain. Both armies were destroyed. The two consuls were killed, and they were both Scipios. Hasdrubal, therefore, prepared to depart from Spain and join his brother Hannibal in Italy, because only by a junction of the two armies And a complete defeat of the Romans could the uh, goal of the long war be achieved. Hasdrubal crossed the Alps with his army, as did Hannibal 12 years earlier. But Hasdrubal did not encounter the same difficulties that plagued uh, Hannibal. Hasdrubal started his journey at a different time after the snows had melted. And he apparently uh, 
took a path that was distinct from the one that, had, that Hannibal had chosen, and to the north of it. He therefore descended into Italy and moved south like an, omin like an omin ominous cloud over the land of, of Italy. Communications, of course, that they, in that ancient time were so poor that Hannibal in the south, in, in Apulia, this area of Italy, only had an idea that Hasdrubal should by this time be across the Alps. Hasdrubal, already in Italy, knew only that uh, Hannibal was somewhere in Italy in the south. But he did not know exactly where. It was important, therefore, that Hasdrubal get information to Hannibal quickly as to Hasdrubal's location and uh, a suggested rendezvous. Hasdrubal, by this time, had reached a reminum, shown as Remini on the map. But at that day and time, it was called a reminum. It was a seaport on the Adriatic coast of Italy. And it was his, his intention to go from there to Narnia in Umbria. And so he prepared a letter. and sent it to Hannibal somewhere in South Italy. Hasdrubal chose six horsemen, two Numidians and four Gauls to carry the message through the land of Italy, which was teeming with Roman and allied troops. In this letter, Hasdrubal apparently not only indicated to Hannibal the location of the rendezvous where the two armies were to join and fight the critical battle of Italy, but he also included in that letter the information concerning his current location and the composition of his entire army. Disaster befell the messengers. They were intercepted. And fortune took a hand. The letter was immediately transmitted uh, to Claudius Nero. And he acted with speed and decisiveness. Setting out from Apulia, where his army faced off Hannibal. And leaving the 30,000 Roman and allied forces under the command of Cassius, a legate, Nero started out under cover of night on a forced march north. Nero knew the location of Hasdrubal's army. He knew the location of the rendezvous at which Hasdrubal had hoped to meet his brother Hannibal and fuse their two armies. Nero also knew that Hannibal did not know the location of Hasdrubal or the location of the rendezvous. 
Nero made a forced march of seven days and arrived in the camp of his consul, his fellow consul, Marcus Livius Salinator. He arrived under the cover of darkness. Hasdrubal was unaware of the presence of two consuls until he went out with a small escort in front of the Roman lines and noticed strange horses, lean horses, more horses than before. And so he sent out a small party to scour the area and to listen whether there were two bugle calls or one. And it was reported back to Hannibal that there were three bugle calls. Hannibal then, uh, Hasdrubal. Hasdrubal therefore knew that his worst fears were true. There were two consuls and their armies. And the third bugle call meant that a Roman praetor, Portius Licinus, was present with his army. Apprehensive, therefore, Hasdrubal gave orders to his troops to pack their baggage in silence stoke the fires and leave at night. In the confusion and the disorder, unfortunately, Hasdrubal's guides were not watched carefully and they went away. Without the guides, Hasdrubal's army wandered aimlessly here and there. Hasdrubal ordered his men to follow the river Metaurus. But without the guides, Hasdrubal and his army wandered blindly along the twists and turns and made little progress. He wasted a day in an effort to find a ford where he could cross the river. This gave the enemy the opportunity to overtake him. There was a fierce battle, and both sides lost heavily. Hasdrubal's uh, elephants caused great disorder among the Romans and forced the columns to retreat. But as the battle grew more fierce and the violence more great and the clamor louder, the elephants became disoriented and they raged from one side to the other like a ship without rudders in a storm. And when they began to charge their own lines, as though they had forgotten to whom they belong, their drivers had to kill them. Time after time, Hasdrubal displayed great courage, and he encouraged his, his men to rally again and again. He led them into danger with his own personal example. And upon more than one occasion, he would stop his soldiers in flight and restore the battle which had been abandoned. Finally, when it was no longer doubtful as to which side would be the victor, Hasdrubal spurred his horse into the Roman lines and died. Died fighting in a manner worthy of his illustrious father, Hamilcar Barca, 
and his inimitable brother, Hannibal. Nero, the next night, started his journey back to Apulia. And uh, he arrived at the Roman camp in southern Italy in six days, making a trip faster than the trip on which he had gone north. Meanwhile, Hannibal was unaware of the absence for two weeks of Nero and the 600 and the 6,000 legionnaires and 1,000 cavalrymen that had been taken by Nero north when he joined with Livius. Hannibal was unaware of the disaster that had befallen his brother until the Roman cavalrymen spurred their horses up to the Carthaginian sentries and tossed at night, tossed a dark object into their midst. When it was brought to Hannibal in his tent, he took one look at it and said, I see there the fate of Carthage. It was the head of his dead brother, Hasdrubal. Hannibal then decamped and took his remaining forces into Bruttium, the uh, toe of Italy. There in the wild and mountainous area from which he had drawn most of his recruits in recent years, and where he was in possession of two small seaports, the seaport of Lacri and the seaport of Croton. Following the Battle of the Matarus, which was one of the decisive battles of the world, Hannibal's last chance and last hope of ever conquering Rome were gone. From that year of 207 BCE to the year 203 BC, Hannibal remained in Italy unconquered. Meanwhile, the main theater of war had shifted to Spain, where uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio, the son of the Scipio who had been wounded at the Battle of the Ticinus River and who incidentally would become the conqueror of Hannibal at Zama in the year 202 BC and who would be given the uh, surname or agnomen Africanus. He was, through his victories in Spain over Hannibal's brother Mago, was wresting the control of Spain out of the hands of the Carthaginians. The years, meanwhile, had taken their toll on Hannibal's forces. No longer did he have the experienced and brilliant officers and experienced warriors who had followed him in the early battles and who had adorned his magnificent exploits in the earlier years. His army now was virtually a new army and in any other hands it would not pose a threat to Rome, but it was the name, the dreaded name of Hannibal that tied down, continued to tie down so many thousands of Romans. Scipio in the year 204 BC moved with his legions to North Africa.
where he attacked Carthage. And in 203 BC, Hannibal was recalled from Italy to Carthage to do battle with Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus Major. Polybius tells us that uh, Hannibal, upon being recalled, was bitter. So now they are recalling me, he said of his government, which for years had refused him money and reinforcements. And he left the little seaport of Croton, and as he was leaving Italy, he looked back upon that land in which he had fought so many bloody battles, and in which he had remained unconquered for 16 years. And the historian tell, tells us that no native ever left his native land with greater chagrin and disappointment and regret than did Hannibal in leaving the enemy land of Italy in 203 BC. The Battle of Zama was fought in the year 202. Scipio defeated Hannibal. Hannibal's defeat uh, can mainly be ascribed to his lack of cavalry. He had to do with 80 elephants who became unmanageable. But in as much as he had little cavalry, he had to use the elephants. Polybius tells us that uh, Hannibal did everything that a good and experienced general was supposed to do. And that the excellence of his troop dispositions could not have been surpassed. There were other advantages that Scipio had, which I will not go into. But terms were entered into between uh, Scipio and Hannibal. And Hannibal recommended to the Carthaginian government that the government agree to the terms. A treaty was signed in the year 201. Uh, BC. Regardless of the achievements, the great achievements of this master strategist and technician, Hannibal, on the battlefield, he was not able to break the strength of the Roman Senate. If it had been any other nation than Rome, his victories would have brought that nation to its knees. Livy, the Roman historian, said that no other nation could have suffered the dis difficult disaster. and not been destroyed. Remember that in one afternoon in Cannae, there were more Romans killed than soldiers lost by the United States in the entire eight years of Vietnam. Mr. 
President, I ask unanimous consent that I may proceed for an additional 10 minutes. Without objection, so ordered. What a terrible loss. The United States lost fewer soldiers in eight years in Vietnam than the Romans lost in one afternoon at the Battle of Kenny. It was the Roman Senate that determined, that, that demonstrated the superb quality of stability. that led the Romans and their allies to victory. The, Han the Hannibalic war, uh, war had cost Rome terribly in treasure and men. He had roamed the land of Italy, burning the towns and cities, ravishing and plundering the countryside, devastating the Roman legions and exacting an awful price in treasure and blood from Rome. And through it all, it was the Roman Senate that led the people to victory. And Mr. President, today is the 778th anniversary of Runemede, the Great Charter. That charter was signed by King John in the year 1215, on June 15th, in the meadow of Runemede beside the Thames River. And this is significant because it was at Runemede that the governed demanded, demanded that the governor recognize certain rights of the governed. The barons, of course, were interested in protecting their own rights, but in doing so, they also protected the rights of freemen. And so they demanded of the sovereign, the executive, that he recognize his limitations and that he recognize their rights. And they broke the tyranny of royal absolutism and the charter in its 63 provisions provided for a committee of nobles, a baron who would call the king to account if he failed to live up to the charter. That was the foundation, the bedrock of American constitutional representative democracy. And the Magna Carta came into its full flowering in the 1600s during the Stuart dynasty. And uh, in 1689, when William and Mary became the two sovereigns. Now the Roman Senate had the same opportunity to exact from the sovereign an assurance of the rights and liberties of the Roman people. And for several hundred years during the early and middle republic, it did that. Roman Senate was supreme. And then it lost its nerve. And uh, it ceded its powers. And it decided that it would give the authority and the right to rule to the emperors. And the Senate then began to recede and decline. And the emperors became all powerful. Now, t today, the United States Senate, these speeches I've been making concern the line item veto. 
I see in these two histories, the histories, history of the Roman Empire and the history of the Magna Carta, I see ourselves as contemplating, following the example of the Roman Senate which lost its nerve, decided that it would cede its powers over to an all-powerful sovereign, and that it would become subordinate to the executive. We could follow the example of the barons at Runnymede and continue to establish the independence of the Senate, the legislative branch, control of the purse, representing the people, protecting the liberties and the rights of the people, placing a limitation, as our constitutional forebears did, upon a chief executive. But instead of that, I'm afraid that we're contemplating following the example of the Roman Senate losing our nerve, permitting a shifting of the power of the people through their elected representatives to an all-powerful executives. If we do that, Mr. President, then we, the senators and representatives of today, will be held accountable by our children and our children's children, just as history held the Roman Senate accountable in the final analysis for the decline of Rome. I yield the flower.